Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, make sure you check out the Potown store, especially over the Christmas and New Year sale, because they have up to 70% off. For today's video, we are going to be looking back at a couple of December tournaments that I've yet to talk about. Uh, there was a Chilean special event as well as a Malaysian regional championships that I'm going to be going over, looking at the lists and discussing what I like and uh, think about how these decks are moving on in the format. We're coming really to the end of the standard metagame for Ultra Prism to Cosmic Eclipse. Sun and Moon is wrapping up and we're moving straight into uh, the Sword and Shield meta very soon. Um, but there is still one regional championships for us Europeans, at least, in the standard format. So I still f thought that these uh, tournaments were worth going over. Um, I am also going to be doing a top tier tweaks uh, in light of Bokum, what decks I would have played. I say would have played because unfortunately I've um, damaged my leg again. <laughs> I am back in a cast, as you can see there. I've got it all propped up right now uh, to the side. Um, I uh, had a great... Um, New Year's and ended up um, uh, tearing my ligaments. So yeah, uh, the legs busted again. It means I can't go to Bochum and maybe not Australia either, which is a bummer. Um, but regardless, let's jump into today's video and talk about uh, the top eight of the special over in Chile. Um, there was over a hundred masters and it was Mewtwo that was able to come out on top. Um, so let's take a look at this list. It actually looks like that it was also the third place list as well, whoops, um, from Marco there, as well as uh, David who took the win. So um, let's have a look at this list. Um, it looks relatively standard. Uh, we've seen a lot of Jirachi based uh, base Mewtwo right now. It's pretty much the only way you play the list these days. Uh, it's playing only two Dedenne, I think, the sort of jury's out. A lot of lists have got away with two Dedenne recently. I'm still very much in the camp of more is better for Dedenne. It's just a very, very good card. But spaces have to be made somewhere. Uh, it's playing the two different uh, Charizard tag teams as well as the family Charizard. So it's got all the firepower. It's got the wall breaking elements to it. It's got decent attacking options. Uh, when you're up against Malamar, you can pretty much forego the Mewtwo for a majority of the game. Just try and use Malolana to heal up your Breakzard, basically. Um, so those are all decent options. Obviously, Brilliant Flare, good attack, just to um, capitalize on when you're knocking out things like the Dene, which is great, or other regular uh, GXs that are around. And even Crimson Pillar GX is just a good option. So this uh, Breakzard has pretty much just become a staple in Mewtwo. I think most people are making a slot for it these days. Um, it's still got SBDO, still got Naga, and um, the Mega Low Puff, of course, a very strong attacker in its own right, Sogolo for recovering energies. And instead of playing the Greninja Rainbow Package, it's playing the Turtonator as the non-GX option to help one-shot through a Keldeo, which is cool. Also playing the Marshadow. For supporters, it's got the regular Four Welder, playing two Malolana, um, and, and is playing no um, Cynthia Caitlyn. Sometimes you see a 1-1 split, sometimes you just see one Malolana, one Guzmahala. Um, I like double Malolana, I think Malamar is a relevant archetype at the moment. I also think that heal can be useful just as doing a 40 heal in the format right now, because of how powerful um, the Tina Chomp deck is. So Malolana, I am pretty happy to see it at two counts, to be honest, I think it's pretty reasonable. Still playing that one Guzmahala. Giving you good options to try and find your escape board, your hearth, your weak guard, or rainbow energies, all very good options for us. Um, in terms of supporters that is kind of like missing, sometimes you see a second copy of Guzhala, sometimes you see, like I said, Sinlin, sometimes um, some other options in there as well. I think normally this is the sort of stuff that you're looking towards. It's supplementing its support account with a power pad rather than a Cynthia Caitlin, which I think is pretty decent. I like just reloading welders. More welders is usually just a good deal, especially when you're Turtonator based. You want to make sure you have welder like instantly, uh, because when you're playing the Greninja Rainbow list, the, you normally already have the energies like on board, and you're just trying to get that Greninja in the bin. Um, but when you're Turtonator based, you need to basically find welder after being stamped to like 
three or four cards. So I like being able to power pad back in Welder. I think that's a strong choice from them. It's got a bunch of two ofs, uh, double Great Catcher, double Switch, double Pokecom to give yourself better outs for that lower Dedenne count. So they are kind of counterbalancing it in that, in that regard and also giving themselves better search options for the Turtle and the Marshadow, which I think is very reasonable. A couple of Poke Gear um, to try and access those welders even more. Uh, I think that is something that we have seen with the move more towards the Tag Call engine as the Poke Gear has sort of slipped away just because um, you already have Stellar Wish. Um, I'm not sure how much I like these Poke Gears, to be honest. Um, I could think about them becoming Acrobikes instead. Uh, you could even think about um, weaving in Treasures. I think Treasures offer some good discard synergy for you, and I think they also offer um, just, again, the means of finding Terminator, the means of finding Marshadow, so those are some pretty important cards. Um, I think, obviously, you're playing the comms as well, so there's kind of the, the biggest debate right now around Mewtwo is, like, these extra kind of slots. I think the four slots you kind of see is the gear and the comm. These are kind of flexible spaces. For, some people will prefer acrobikes. Some people will prefer treasures. Some people will prefer like just higher tag call, higher supporter. Some people will go for a higher stadium count. Those are kind of the flexi spots in Mewtwo right now, in my opinion. Um, but all very reasonable. Obviously, tag calls, cherish pulls, all the usual stuff. Playing one copy of reset stamp is kind of scary. You know, I was saying those four slots. Normally, you would see double reset stamp. Uh, in many ways, it's kind of greedy to just be, see one stamp, but I guess with a slightly less uh, Dead A Change focus build, you can get away with it. But I would always insist on two reset stamps in my Mewtwo's. Um, playing the double board, it's still playing Stealthy Hood. I think ultimately, Malamar's got to a point where you basically can never put down Mewtwo. Um, unless you're, like, going first and are able to go Welder Attach, um, so you can go for a big SBDO play. I think in almost every other matchup when you're up against Malamar, you just have to try and pretend to be a Charizard deck. You just have to use both your um, Charizard tag teams and just try and Malolana heal them. So I don't even know how good Stealthy Hood is as a space anymore. I think it's still, like, a decent card against... Um, Ability Zard for trying to protect your tag team at the back, but I personally start to think that um, Stealthy Hood's becoming less and less good in the deck. I, I think Malamar has kind of moved on. They're playing Faber already, so the Stealthy Hood feels pretty weak to me. I think if I was playing Mewtwo in the future, I would just play other cards over Stealthy Hood. I think it's a pretty weak link in the deck right now. Uh, three Giant Hearth, obviously they're not playing uh, any basic Psychic Energy, so no need for... Um, the Viridian, but sometimes you see a fourth stadium of even just one swell creeping into lists um, has been the case, so that's something you, you could consider. I like the high, uh, the slightly higher counts of uh, physical fire energies when you are, again, Turtonator based. I think nine is your minimum when you play Turtonator. Still playing that three rainbow and one weak guard. Sometimes you do see a 2-2 two -two split, but obviously this list has been successful. It's uh, got the win and the top four, so... Um, there's a lot of good going on in this build overall, and I think Mewtwo's are starting to get quite optimized overall. Sebastian was able to come in second with the good old Tina Chomp uh, list. Um, this is, again, starting to pick up a lot of steam, I think. Um, this is probably within a top five deck sort of contention right now. A lot of people are considering it to be one of the best builds out there. It's very disruptive. It's got good early pressure, just doing those 40 prods into Calamita Slash on turn two. Definitely a lot of pressure against a lot of different archetypes, so that's very cool. You've got the Bocephalon option, where you force the control decks to go down in prizes with the Miss Magius, and then you start firing off uh, your fireworks with the Blown, which is very cool. Um, this list is playing the Nag Guz, uh, even though it's not playing any copies of Beast Ring. Sometimes you see one copy. The Beast Ring can be nice for both this and the Baby Blown, but no copies are being included at all in this one. Um, just sticking to the raw principles of um, Miss Magius getting out into play as much as possible and trying to be aggressive in that regard. Uh, lower your opponent's hand size with early stamps and such. Um, this support count is actually really aggressive. Um, it's playing one copy of Malo Lana. Um, normally you'd see... I would, I would normally sit around two copies, but... Just the one copy right now. It's obviously playing Faber that helps you get around um, the Swells, so you can get through Kelio quite easily. 
Um, you've got things like Lieutenant Surge to try and double up on certain cards. Sometimes you can go like Surge into Sinlin into the best supporter in your discard pile or Surge into Greens into like another supporter. Like you go Surge Greens Faber. These sorts of plays are all very cool. It's got a fairly low count of the gears and tackles. Three of each, three treasure, double dust stone. There's not too much that's that outlandish with this list. Um, I think the aggressive support count is really the only... I say aggressive, I mean, they're only playing one Malolana, and they're playing Surge. Surge isn't, like, a guaranteed in the deck, um, but it's definitely a, a reasonable card, and I know a lot of people swear by the one-off, saying it wins them so many games, but in my personal opinion, it's, like, less cards off of Mysterious Message, and that's, like, the most important thing about the deck. Um, but overall, everything seems pretty reasonable here. Full-on rainbow count rather than fiddling around with like one or two dark energies and stuff. Uh, that would only really be the case if you did play the good old one-off B-string, uh, but that not being implemented in this list. Overall, we've seen a couple of variations of Teen Chomp at this point. Um, we've seen some wheezing Roxy builds, which are quite exciting. Uh, I haven't tested out um, one of the other um, super, like a, a lot, so I don't really want to comment on which one I think is better, but they both seem very reasonable. There was a Malamar in top 8, and um, it seemed to do, like, this deck as well seems to be in top 5 kind of contention, Malamar being a big punisher of Mewtwo, and Mewtwo is super popular right now, um, so trying to take advantage of that is cool. It's also got some new innovative ways to deal with some other matchups, the Trev Noir being a great include to help out against ADP, you just Pale Moon GX, they um, are no longer able to... Like, if you do that on their GX turn, they're then, like, back to just manually attaching for a number of turns, and you can just start Night Watching as well, which is pretty sweet. Night Watch, a very strong attack against Dolls, very strong attack against uh, Pidgeotto, if you want to go down that route. Uh, also, against Pidgeotto, you have the usual stuff of just trying to spread damage with your Mew and your Blown and stuff, so that's always reasonable. You've also got Celtic Order as an option now as well, which is very good against... Um, the control-based decks, because you can take a double prize, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, the Nag Guz being a cool include here. Very nice card against things like Tina Chomp, actually. With Tina Chomp coming so much back into popularity, having Violent Appetite against them is actually a real pain in the neck for them, so that's a really cool ability. It's playing double Malolana, so you can see that this list is really tag team focused. They get tag teams out in a lot of matchups, uh, which is pretty interesting for sure. Um, it's even got a tag call in here. The mini tag call engine, the the seriously mini tag call engine, is a really cool innovation of Malamar. Don't know how much, it, how like strong it actually is, but there's a lot of wackiness going on in this list. You can see they're playing spinners rather than um, Viridians, and they're actually playing swells on their own end. Um, again, um, just trying to say no to some important cards. Uh, is pretty sweet, uh, saying no to things like labs, so your spell tags always work, saying no to your opponent being able to use um, their key stadiums like Hearth and such, really does slow down a lot of decks. Like One of the reasons why ADP is so strong is simply because Swell is such a strong card, and that statement's being made in this Malamar list right now that it's so strong that it's better than you playing your own Viridian because people kind of like high roll you less with... Like, they have less optimal turns just because swells down and they can't you know start halfing for welders and stuff so this is swell is basically an anti mewtwo card in many ways at the moment that's kind of how it feels so that's certainly reasonable uh but it's good against all sorts of decks like it's good against ability zard and baby blounds and stuff just because again they're all reliant on their uh, stadiums in those early turns just to thin their deck more than anything else um it's playing double stamp um, so there's a lot going on with this Malamar. It's super different to every other Malamar we've seen. It's got a slightly lower Jirachi count. Um, the double stamp is yeah something we basically never see with Malamar. Um, it's got a bit of a trade-off where it's not playing any any Acrobikes. It's only playing three Com for Treasure. It's only playing you know four Lily, three Cynthia. It does have the one Sinlin to try and counterbalance that. By the way, I really like one Faba, one Sinlin in lists. Even in regular Malamars, I would play one one of these cards right now. I think they're super good. Um, but it's made a lot of like big decisions to make spaces for this mini tackle package, as well as these two key attackers. It really does feel like 
when you're playing with this list, you would be much more heavily focused on using your tag team. Uh, even if it is just in the mid game, you still probably try and kick start your game with distortion door plus spell tag shenanigans, and then you try and work these in in the sort of mid to late game, unless it's against things like ADP where this GX attack is bonkers or um, a few other situations where these cards are just really insane. So yeah, very interesting Malamar list. Um, I'm not sure how many other people are going to take on board this mini tag call package, but all the cards are strong, so there's nothing like too wrong with it. Also seeing Swell popping up in decks outside of ADP is something that I pretty much always expected at some point. Uh, I didn't expect Malamar to be the, one of the first ones to do it though. So that's a really interesting, um, really, really interesting list for sure. There was an ADP uh, that made top four, but we only have a list for these other ADPs. Uh, we see an, an ADP um, Glaceon GX, which is pretty spicy. Um, it's got the 1-1 one, one Glaceon GX line in here. Glaceon, of course, Freezing Gaze being a great ability against Mewtwo. Great against a few other crucial cards as well. Um, your uh, Polispear GX is obviously a dangerous option. Frost Bullet doing way better damage uh, with that ADP GX attack buff. It also has a Silvalli GX in here as well. Um, just off of the Ditto alone, it's not playing any actual type nulls. Um, so this can this ditto can be either a Glaceon or a Silvalle when it needs to be. Um, Silvalle obviously a decent option for just drawing new cards and having a GX attack to get through um, Ultra Beast, which is decent. It's got the Luke Metal to help out against Guardian. I pretty much think that's kind of an effort in vain when they play Lugia anyway as like a staple, but it's still something you can go for. And at the very least, there's like a different weakness and such. Um, one copy of Keldeo, um, just because you're trying to go down different avenues anyway with this list by the looks of things. You can see Misty Lorelei is a potential option alongside this Glaceon, uh, which is pretty spicy. Still got the Krogonal and Fionn for the control matchups. Um, its supporter line is relatively thin. Uh, we're not seeing any Rosa. We're not seeing any uh, Bill's Analysis, even as like one-offs. Um, we're just seeing the tag call package in quite a high count, really high Sinlin count. And also incorporating that Misty Lorelei uh, to give yourself more GX attacks with like Resolute Blade and stuff, which is powerful. Customs obviously stable these days in ADP. Um, it's got the regular switching counts. It's got two Cherish Balls, so again, just trying to help you get your Stage 1s out more often than not. Also good access to Keldeo. It's got the double stamp, it's got the counter game, the swells. Pretty much it's just tried to shoehorn a couple Stage 1s into a regular ADP. Uh, Having that Glaceon as an option is obviously a pain for Mewtwo and uh, is definitely an interesting include. That I don't know if many people are going to be going for it themselves, uh, but it certainly could be the case. Um, so yeah, if you want to help out your Mewtwo matchup, uh, you can go for the, Kel the Glaceon route rather than the Keldeo route of ADP, which is pretty cool. Uh, the amount of people running Greninja as a staple, Turfnator as a staple, Keldeo maybe not be the answer to beat Mewtwo anymore. Um, so, Glaceon could legit be the stronger option, so, cool tech for sure. Um, what else do we have? We've got a regular ADP here from Carlos in top 8. More back to basics, really. It's got the Giraffe to get rid of uh, Greninjas, if you see them. You've got the Absol to slow down opposing Jirachis. I still love this as a staple card. It's got Drampa to help you get through opposing Keldeos for mirror matches. So, this is a much more uh, back to basics list. It's playing the more usual supporter line, I guess, with the Lilies and Roses. Uh, yeah, this is just a this is a really um, usual list, I think. Like, if you're just looking for a stock list of ADP, this is more or less it. Um, yeah, pretty solid stuff. Simple ADP, doing good, is also still a thing, I guess, in the meta. And then to round out the top eight, we do see a Guard of War and Sylveon. Guardian, I think, is a very well-positioned archetype. I'm surprised, actually, they didn't go further into top eight. Maybe it hit one of the worst matchups, but I mean, it's got a decent Mewtwo and it's got a decent um, ADP and uh, also Tina Chomp. I think one thing you'll notice is that it's not playing the Dragon Charm. I think Dragon Charm is becoming more of a staple in Guardian, even if it is just a one of copy, potentially a two of though, um, to improve those matchups, because I do think it's very solid um, against. Like I said, um, the Tina Chomp deck, which is becoming more and more popular. So that's something I could definitely see coming into this Guardian. 
Um, there's not too much that's different from the initial regional winning list from Drew. Uh, it's added in the wait and see hammer, I think is one of the biggest changes to the list from uh, just eyeballing it. I think that's one of the only differences that we see from the 60. Uh, everything else is more or less just the list that we had brought to us by Drew. I've been trying out a lot of uh, Guardian recently. Um, I've actually chopped away the Omastar line. <laughs> uh, so I might do a video of um, Guardian um, pretty soon because... Yeah, I've moved away from Omastar just because I think control decks, if they want to be Omastar, they can. Um, so I've made those spaces other things. But yeah, Guardian's still very solid. I like its meta placement. Um, the fact that Tina Chomp is becoming a bigger presence in the format as well, even though it's probably always going to be less than like 10% of the field because it is a difficult deck to get your head around and not necessarily um, one that's easy to pilot. I think it's still worth trying to have a decent matchup against that with the tech of um, the Dragon Charm because it also comes in relatively handy against ADP. I know a lot of ADP players will just try to go like lone Keldeo against the Guardian anyway, uh, but sometimes they still want to go for the ultimate Ray GX attack just to um, just to get their damage a bit stronger against the Gardevoirs. So having the Charm to deny any ultimate rays sounds pretty strong to me. Let's go on to the uh, Kuala Lumpur regionals again this is a slightly bigger tournament it's got 282 masters and once again it was Mewtwo that's able to win with Brent Tonneson here Brent's been playing a lot of um, Mewtwo lately I think and his list is Greninja based he's playing the Greninja Rainbow uh, rather than the Turtonator I think the Greninja option is a lot better against Reset Stamp but your damage output is a lot worse, so it's a bit of a trade-off, and you are weaker to Giraffe, so definitely an interesting choice whether you go down this route or the um, Turtonator route. I'm not certain on which is strongest here, um, but they've got all the regular attackers choosing to play Latios still in the list. Actually not playing uh, Naganadel, which is an interesting choice. They've made a space just to cut the Naga Snipe option, uh, which is kind of bold. Um, but they're counterbalancing it with a third great catcher, so maybe they see more value in that overall. Uh, it's got the double Malolana, double uh, Guzhala, the four acro bikes. See, this is what I was talking about earlier, that some people will just go for bikes over anything else, because bikes are just digging in general. Uh, quite as Not quite as specific as Poker Gears, but they have extra discard synergy, and they just, see, they just help you see more cars in general, so... Um, I'm a decent fan of Acrobikes. I don't think I'd ever play 4 in Mewtwo. I think maybe like 2 is a sweet spot, but that's pretty cool to see. Still got the Cherish Balls, the Tag Calls, the High Great Catch account. Uh, it's got the Stealthy Hood. It's got the 2-1 split of stadiums. Quite low, but one of those stadiums is swell. That's the kind of counterbalance, I guess. Um, but I don't think this list is necessarily that good against... Um, power plants. You have to be a little bit cautious about that sort of matchup. Uh, rather than binning your Mega low puff, you probably have to put it into play and start swinging with that guy at certain moments of the game. Um, because otherwise you're going to get power planted out, I'm sure. And it's got the 8-3-1. Again, you could sometimes see one, sometimes see a 2-2 split of these cards. Especially when you don't play the Naganadel. There's maybe potentially more reason to play a 2-2 split. Um, but they still like the option of Latios, which is obviously fine. And this was also in uh, Jack Miller's top four list as well. So um, you can see the list obviously doing quite well overall. Uh, Mohammed was able to come second with a very spicy ADP. So we've seen all sorts of different ADPs coming out of the woodwork. We saw a list of stage ones. We saw a bread and butter list of ADP. And now we're seeing a victory sign Victini trying to accelerate ADP more quickly. Um, so that you can get into your auto creation and your ultimate rays. And then you have the big payoff of Moltra, Zapdos, and Articuno. Well, it's a big boy. It's got 300 hit points, which is a big... Yeah, it's a lot to get through. Uh, Trinity Burn with the GX damage buff does 240, which is super scary. And you do have an alternate GX attack option. Um which does a uh, 110 snipe to three of your opponent's bench, which is very good against non-GX decks, against Pidgeotto, against uh, Bird Blounds. That's really, really dangerous. Um, obviously, against non-GXs, ADP's GX attack is very strong as well. So 
I don't know the specifics of why this card is here, but it's here. <laughs> I mean, answers on a postcard why this is a card that people play rather than just regular ADP? I'm not so sure, but um, when you're not playing Keldeo, you can go down a completely different route, and that's the Greens route. Uh, you get to play Power Plants, make your stamps a lot stronger, you get to uh, um, have better access to your cards just through the Greens engine, basically. Previously, we saw ADP as a Greens list uh, that was just like quad Arceus Palki Dialga and like one uh, Luke Metal and still had the Croganals. Now we're seeing Victini coming in uh, to try and protect your big boys on the bench a little bit more, which I'm certainly a fan of. Whenever I tested the Greens ADP list, uh, the initial one after LATAM, I was like, you have no chance against Mewtwo because you just sit there with your three prizer that just gets destroyed straight away. This list at least protects you a little bit, forces Gust out of the opponent at the same time, which is at least a small help. You have Choice Helmet to make yourself a little bit bulkier against that Mewtwo as well, which is pretty essential, I would say. Your energy line is wacky, obviously, um, but uh, it's just the nature of trying to use the three bird trio. Obviously, you need the metals to try and weave in this ADP as well. So, again, it's one of these decks that I need to try out, um, but it's pretty wild. It's got a pretty similar supporter line to um, Gardevoir Sylveon, um, so that's an interesting um anecdote i guess just because you're gonna know how it feels to play this list if you've played uh god of our sylveon much even though it is completely different in your sort of win conditions i guess you could say but the actual 60 cards is familiar in terms of looking like a guardian that has more basic energies in the list basically um so yeah that's a very wild adp list and I don't know how or why, but it got second. <laughs> we see Tan with Gardevoir Sylveon. Again, this is the deck that I am like most comfortable playing right now. His list also brings some innovation. Um, he is playing that Dragon Charm, which I'm a big fan of. I think it was a great tech call. Um, he definitely made the right choice with how the meta is shaping up. Also got an Ability Charm in there. The biggest thing I see here is Triple Scooper Scoop Up. Trying to undo a lot of damage on that head flip is super enraging for a bunch of different matchups. Um, giving yourself that level of healing is super annoying against Tina Chomp, against Malamar, against everything really that can't one ban you. So these cards are obviously very strong. I remember back at Worlds, uh, Super Scoop Up was like a stapling Guardian. Um, so seeing it come back isn't super surprising. Still made the space for the Omastar. Also got a wait and see hammer going on in here. It's got, again, that sort of regular support count. Rather than playing um, Coach Trainer, they're playing a Cynthia as well as a Lusamine, which isn't super common, but it does give them more options to power plant. I guess they're playing a Lusamine over a fourth plant. Um, so in a way, it's a small consistency buff, um, if you can think about it that way. He's quite cheeky on the um, gusting front. He's got double Great Catcher, double Customs, rather than four and one. So he's made spaces here and there. And I think that's just really a testament to Super Scoop Up and how strong he feels in his feels that it is in his list. Um, because he's sort of cut some corners here and there. As you can see, just playing one switch. There's a lot of like greed going on here. But it's all greed so that you can get the big payoff of Super Scoop Up. Uh, and I'm sure he's probably won games just on Super Scoop Upping stuff alone. So yeah, still got the Omastar in there as well. Uh, which I've already said my piece on. A couple more lists going on here. We will see uh, Cameron with, again, the wackiness, the craziness. Man, it, it's good old, um, what do you call it, checkmate. There's all sorts going on here. you got the draw engine of Pidgeys and Jirachi. you got the Catwalk. you got Stinger. you got Charge Up if you need to. You've got Whimsicott and Ninetales as potential annoying walling attackers, attackers that have really good typing right now. Um, obviously both of these can only be evolved from Ditto. You've got Mimikyu in here to try and help out against uh, Mewtwo. You can try and even just use it with Roxy Weezing. You just go Mimikyu, Roxy Weezing, or Mimikyu, uh, Psy Power, and try and shut off Mewtwo's that way. It's got Tyro going on in here to try and set up some cute math for you as well. Um, uh, try and close games after you've gone for a, a Stinger GX, so that's pretty wild. All of this Roxy shenanigans, it's all basically trying to put things in range of vengeance, I think, most of the time. 
I do think Vengeance is super busted, and I do really like this option of going for Stinger into Vengeance for game. And you can see it's got the coughing and wheezings going on here, just to try and get that uh, Roxy rolling to get things in range of your Vengeance. So I do think it's a valid strategy for sure. It's got a Ranguru going, in, going on in here. It's got the old Island Challenge Amulet, which is like a staple for uh, the Stinger-based builds. Um, but yeah, Roxy's a big part of your draw engine, and you can see why. He plays such a silly amount of Pokemon. It's really wild. It's got the stamps going on. It's got the Beast Ball, so you, you uh, don't worry about prizing your one-offs, which is cool. Uh, fishing Rod to try and get back some of your stuff, some of your Pokemon as well. Man, it's wacky. It's It's fun. Uh, again, it's one of these decks I want to try out. I'm actually a big fan of, like, Vengeance-style attacks. Um, and this one seems more straightforward than other checkbait lists I've seen previously. Because the goal is a lot more damage-based than a lot of previous Stinger lists. A lot of the time it was way more abstract how you, f how you had a damaging finisher. But now you're just, like doing Roxy spread around the board, so it's pretty obvious where your prizes will end up on with a Vengeance. That's pretty much uh, how I foresee things going. And then you have just, like, annoying walling stuff in here for all sorts of other matchups as well. So, yeah, pretty funky. Uh, pretty annoying deck. And always a headache to play against those sorts of things. It's just hard to navigate uh, for everyone involved. We'll round out the top eight with a another Roxy Weezing build. This time is the Tina Chomp. We saw the previous list that was um, more straightforward and is just trying to be um, all about just going for those like aggro stamps and trying to get your um, Tina Chomp rolling. This build a little bit more aggressive with your damage output. Again, this one is kind of more robust against tech cards. You're much better against Choice Helmet. You're much better against uh, Great Potions. You just physically are better against things like Reset Stamp because you'll have already established damage on board, hopefully, with your Weezings. Um, so, in theory, it's more stamp-proof, but I do think you have a slightly weaker early game because you are committing spaces to four Roxy and four Weezings. Roxy itself isn't that good of a consistency card because you actually have a fairly low Pokemon count. Normally with this list, uh, you try and make up for that with Lure Ball, but Lure Ball isn't an instantly useful card, you know? You, you need to wait for the Weezings to be online for it to be very, very strong. So this list is slightly more awkward to use, uh, but there are bigger payoffs as you push into the late game. So if you can get over that early game hump, you still play four greens, you still play the double Sindin, you still play two tackles. You've got decent turn one draw options. Roxy can usually draw you like three cards turn one. Um, if it's not like having to get rid of a mischievous or something, you can get away with Roxy for three on turn one, like a decent number of times, but, um, it's not quite as consistent, I think, as the regular Tina Chomp build, at least in those opening turns. I think it gets better towards the late game, but in those early game turns, I do think it's fragile. Also not having the, um, Naga Guz, there's definitely big benefits to playing Nag Guz in the list. Um, having a different GX stack available for you to close out games is always really cool. Um, having different options, uh, things that can get through Keldeo, for example, in one hit uh, when you don't when you do go for that Faber Power Plant play, compared to Tina Chomp that only does 160 to them, even if you've gone Faber Plant, which really sucks. So there's certainly reasons why you might want to try and weave in the um, Nag Guz into this list, but that's obviously a lot of spaces that you have to commit. It's not only like one Nagagaz and the rainbows. Sometimes it's a little bit more. So um, yeah, this is the alternate approach to the list. Much more aggressive in that late game. You can try and just go slash slash game. Uh, thanks to previous setup damage of those Weezing Roxies. Um, but I do think it has a slightly more fragile early game. I think you draw less cards with your Mysterious Message in those owning turns. So it's less likely you can punish people with that aggressive stamp early on in the game. You're only playing two power plants, so again, that's a lot less of an option as well. So it's a trade-off. It's, you know, like early consistency versus late game having win on board. And it's kind of what your preference is to which is going to be the stronger list. We'll have a quick look at the other decks that did make uh, in and around the top. There was a Breaksard in at top 16, which is pretty cool. More of the wheezing and regular builds. So it's going to be a bit of a tug of war to see which is the better Tina Chomp here. Uh, I'm still not really sold on one or the other being way better. We actually see another uh, ADP Bird Trio in top 16. So there's something there for sure. 
Um, we see a Greens Luke Metal. I do think this is a solid deck in the format right now as well. Very solid against a lot of ADP lists and pretty solid against Guardian, obviously. Uh, very solid against Malamar. I think there's some decent matchups for Luke Metal. Uh, lots of Mewtwo, a few other Guardians and ADPs. Nothing too exciting here. Towards the bottom of top 32, a couple of uh, Reshizards, which isn't super surprising. An ADP Buzzmoser as well. So nothing super crazy. Uh, what what wacky stuff was Clive playing? He was playing ADP Spiritum. You, you always got to keep an eye out for Clive. He's always playing the wacky stuff, right? <laughs> so yeah, that is going to be me. Uh, be my analysis of the top eight lists from these two regionals. I know it's a little bit late now, but um, still in time for your testing towards Bochum. So hopefully that's been helpful for you guys. It's good to be back in the new year, and I'm going to be trying to get videos done daily again. So look out for those. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in another video tomorrow. Cheers.